welcome to Hope City Chapel. My name is Pastor Jason Brett. It is a joy to be with you here this morning. Last week, we began a series on the book of Colossians, and we studied chapter 1. And so I'd just like to review that a little bit, and then we'll get on to chapter 2. So in chapter 1, Paul began to address some errors in theology that were being promoted at the Colossian church. Paul began this letter by bringing the congregation back to their foundation in Jesus Christ. He then praises their efforts in loving one another as fellow believers. And he also lets them know that their pastor has their back. We discovered from the book Bible Doctrines that Arius, a minister of the Church of Alexandria, taught and was spreading this gospel of his own that Christ is a creature halfway between God and man. He was more than human, but less than God. Once he taught that God lived alone and had no son. Then he created Christ, who created everything else in it. So Paul is writing to the congregation in an attempt to restore Jesus, the Messiah, to the center of their lives. And we mentioned that God still works through personal correspondence. It was, it was their pastor, Epaphras, who let Paul know of the issue that at hand. And this inspired Paul to write this letter to the Colossian church. Number two, his approach, people respond better when they are encouraged about things, when they are praised about things, and it prepares them and readies them. Number three, we too are exposed to various belief systems in this world. Even more today, with the rise of social media, there are so many things that we can be exposed to that if we are not careful to continue to keep ourselves grounded in Jesus Christ and in the authority of scriptures, any one of us, because of the nature of our flesh, can get off and go down a direction that God never intended us to go down. And number four, it's important that we remain grounded in our Christian faith. And other with Jesus being our foundation and our relationship with God being our foundation, we also, it's important that we continue to walk in love towards our fellow believers. And we all know that walking in love is a decision that we have to make, and it's not based on how we feel at the moment or, or whatever prejudices we may have against some other people. And thank God for his grace and forgiveness. So this week, we want to go to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we want to continue to follow Paul as he continues to give the church instruction about the supremacy of Christ over and above the teachings that they are hearing. He's letting them know that Jesus and Jesus alone leads the Christian church, that he occupies the center of creation and salvation without peers. So in Colossians chapter 2, I'm going to be reading verses 9 through 11, then 16 and 17. I will be reading this from the New International Version. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are merely shadows of things that were to come, 
The reality, however, is found in Christ. Let me pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and for our foundation in the Lord Jesus Christ and of the many things, Lord, that you have to say to us and ground us in your word and for being our Father and for Jesus being our Savior and the Holy Spirit leading us in this life of the Christian gospel. We ask, Father, that we may continue to see things from your point of view, that we may be given spiritual insight and understanding, that we pray, Father, that our outward lives, which others see, may bring credit to Jesus, and that we may bring joy to his heart by bearing genuine Christian fruit. Let our knowledge of you grow ever deeper, and as we live this life, we ask that we would be strengthened from your boundless resources. In Jesus' name, amen. So the era, error of the Colossian heresy was a defective view of Christ. Jesus was believed to be lesser than a deity. So I want to point out three truths that Paul brings to this congregation about the truth of the essence of Jesus. Number one, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus Christ. The scripture says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And that word fullness means a filling, like filling a container. Like Jesus' physical body was filled with the presence and the essence of God through the Holy Spirit. Jesus, he's telling them that Jesus is both fully human as well as fully divine. That he is equal with God. So in this scripture, Paul is directly addressing the error in the teaching which is known as Gnosticism. So this teaching claimed to provide secret knowledge about God. It said that the material world was evil and its creator a lesser deity. Gnostics believed that Christ was a kind of anointing or presence and that this Christ came upon the man Jesus at his baptism and departed before his crucifixion. In their view, Christ didn't have a physical body. So you can see what Paul needs to address in the, and the views that were distorted about who Jesus really is and about what he actually taught. But Paul goes at it. It's important to know his approach that he takes toward the Colossian church. He approaches them in humility and just an honoring of, the, of God and of what revelation Jesus brought to him. He knew that these people were young in the Christian faith. They were former pagans, and some of them were also Jews that had come over to Christianity as a result of Jesus' ministry. So it was really mattered the language that he used with these young people. And secondly, he knew the predominant teaching of the pagan world was philosophical in nature. That's what was happening in the culture at the time. But philosophy... Although it may not be bad in itself, it doesn't speak anything about our relationship with God, which is the foundation of our relationship and of our Christian faith. And it's only limited to human reason. So many of these former pagans found it difficult to grasp the Christian belief that Christ has always existed from all eternity and is equal with God the Father. 
they, they were not approaching this as God being our Heavenly Father, as Jesus being the model of God in the earth. And now remember that these people are young, that they're coming into the faith and they're just beginning to grow in the ways of God. So il illustration, when God saved me, I immediately began to get all the tapes that I could and things about Jesus and things about uh, the church and things about the doctrine of the ministry of the Christian faith. But I put so much stock in knowing things about what someone else said that it all remained up in my head. And, it, and for a long time, did not get down to where it needed to get to where I'd have my own voice about things with Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying this is not a good place to start, but you got to understand that when we're first saved, we've got to grow in things and that we don't always get it right away. That's why grace was given through Jesus Christ. That's why, that's why Jesus doesn't expect us to be perfectly mature Christians as soon as we get saved. I don't know about you out there, but I was not perfect when I got saved. I still had some things to grow out of, and thank God for His grace that He allowed that because He knew how to get me to where He wants me to be. And so it is with you. So it is with the world. And another example with that is my daughter Faith. She's nine years old, and somehow, when I sometimes try to tell her things out of my own experience and out of my own understanding of life, she thinks that she knows it better than I do. And I'm sure anyone out there who is a parent may understand what I'm talking about. So it was important that Paul understood the audience that he was coming to and his approach being one of mercy, one of compassion, one of encouragement. And then secondly, verse 10 says, And in Christ you or we have been brought to fullness, that he, Jesus Christ, is the head over every power and authority. Now, the terms power and authority here are in reference to angels. So, in addition to the false teaching that Christ Jesus is a lesser deity and that the material world is evil, there was a misinterpretation going around about angelic order and authority. So, there, there are several reasons for this. So, the word angel also means messenger. And it was sometimes difficult to determine whether a messenger during Bible times was human or angelic. They appeared in different forms. And so to most Jews, angels were exalted beings, especially revered because they have been involved in the giving of the law, which to the Jewish crowd was God's supreme revelation. So Paul is telling us also in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 he says, so he became much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to their. Paul is addressing and letting them know that we as his body, the body of Christ, hold a higher position of authority than the angels do. My Bible tells me that the angels are ministering spirits sent to assist the believer. Hallelujah. That's out of Psalm 91. And so Paul has brought encouragement about the essence of Jesus. Secondly, he has corrected their thinking about the superiority of angels over and above Jesus Christ, who is the head of all of it, and that we, as his body, have authority 
of a greater position and value as his sons and as his daughters than angelic beings do. And that we have a purpose to spread this gospel and we have the gifts of the Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit as all these things to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and to bring the truth of what the scripture is saying. So, and thirdly, in Christ, all the requirements of the Mosaic law have been met. Verse 11, verse 11 16, and 17 says, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Now he's talking about two circumcisions here, which is the circumcision that the Jewish people had as a symbol of their covenant with God. That God had made a covenant with the Jewish people through Moses when he brought them out of Egypt, and that the law was necessary, but it simply revealed to us that we are not sufficient in ourselves and by obeying the law to be purified in the covenant of God, that it required a blood sacrifice. So God had this elaborate system to require this elaborate system of rules and regulations and the shedding of blood on a daily basis for the forgiveness and the remission of the sins. So this was the beginning covenant. And then with the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of the requirements of the law were met when he was hung on that cross, when he breathed his last breath, and when he tore the curtain in two, symbolizing that sin no longer separated God and man. And that on the third day, he was resurrected to give new life and fellowship to us to restore that fellowship with God which he has been working from the beginning to restore. And in Romans 13, Jesus tells us in the beginning that the commandments can all be summed up in loving our neighbor as ourselves. Paul began this, this message by telling them about their love for Jesus and their foundation for Jesus, which brings us to a love of ourselves. And then he tells them about loving the fellowship. Hallelujah. That it's by grace through faith. But I think the problem here, one of the issues was that for these former pregnancies, it seemed more reasonable that those that they considered Christ to be more of a divine hero, greater in authority than a human being, than an ordinary human being, but of lower rank than the eternal God. So they, they were in their reason still. And Jesus changed all of that by bringing fellowship again. But I think that sometimes it's easier for us to be stimulated by ideas and concepts than to allow ourselves to be vulnerable in a relationship. Because relationships can be messy. They involve risk. They involve accountability. They involve trust. And that is a hard thing to do. But Jesus, through completely obeying the Father and shedding his blood, said, this is how much I want you to have what I have with the Father. He was the only deity figure who called God his Father 
and invites us to grow in a real relationship with him. So why am I making us aware of these problems and these heresies that happened in the early church? Certainly we have so many things that have taught us differently than what they were following and the philosophies that they were following. But I say, I think number one, we can say that, but even after this letter was written, the teaching of Arius still persisted for some time. The teaching that God was lesser than a deity still persisted for some time. And because, and that's why the creeds were coming about and were, were helping to be written. God was using councils to put together creeds to really get a handle on the essence of Jesus. And that is available to us today. And it also... That because only 505 years ago did Martin Luther nail his 95 thesis to the Wittenberg Castle church door. Richard Foster points out in his book, Streams of Living Water, he says, Luther is most remembered for nailing his 95 thesis to the Wittenberg Castle church door on October 31st, 1517. Luther's listing of specific abuses connected with self-indulgences. Now, what happened at the time was John Johann Tetzel was fundraising and he was using a rhyme by saying, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. So now I'm not stating, I'm not doing this to point fingers at all because all of us are susceptible to error and the nature of the flesh. In, in the, this, with the church, here we're looking for the obsession of money and power. They were using their position of power and saying things in direct opposition to the gospel of Jesus to bring money in and saying that because you're giving money that you're going to be saved and that you're going to, that you're going to be able to give your life and that God will save you. And so this kind of a thing can happen to anyone as we've seen. When we take our eyes off of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important that we understand and keep light of the fact that these scriptures were inspired by God as authority to keep us grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we experience him, that we continue to follow after these principles in scripture. Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the whole Trinity, that relationship, and the word of God function together. Because Jesus is known as the living word. Now Luther when he was threatened by the church to retract his findings, he said, it is impossible for me to recant unless I am proved wrong by the testimony of Scripture. My conscience is bound by the Word of God. So we as believers today may find it somewhat difficult to understand that people may have believed these ide ideologies back at that time, but you've got to understand the culture and the issues that were surrounding them at the time. And I believe that what we believe today about the essence and authority of Jesus has come through us through the grace of God, through methods of councils who wrote creeds such as the Nicene Creed, such men as that were inspired as Martin Luther, and his stand about the authority of Scripture, such as the worldwide distribution of the Bible, and, and also Bible schools and evangelical ministry that we have today. So thank God for His grace of getting these things to us and of raising us up, this body of Christ, to exalt and to bring about Jesus Christ and to bring about His power and to get this world to give their lives and to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah.
Well, I hope that today that God has touched your heart today. I hope that something that I said, something was inspi- has inspired your heart to dig deeper into the scripture and the things and the history that we have in the evangelical ministry and, and the faith and the word of God. Hallelujah. If you would like to reach out to us at Hope City, whether it's for prayer, maybe other programs that are on the network, or general information, feel free to visit our website at hopecitylife.com. Until next time, have a great day and God bless you.